Right, we're here back at RE Performance with the main man, Ricky. How you doing, buddy? Morning. So, um, what delights have you got to show us and tell us about in the engineering, so the engine building room today? Uh, so, I think last time we done blocks and rods and <laughs> rods. Um, so, I think we do cylinder heads now. So, we've got uh, a V10 Gen 2 cylinder head and then a valve train to go in it. So, we'll just run through um the bits and pieces what we see what we've changed to and what from uh why we've changed it uh and then we'll put a valve in and use a fancy tool to put um put a valve and a retainer in um and then i think afterwards we'll do some maths um we've got a spring tester so we'll do that as a separate video but we'll run through the different spring pressures, installed heights, what that means, why you do it, uh, and then sort of, you know, just have a little, have a little bit of a workout. Um, the pros and cons, yeah. Good should stuff. all make, should all make sense, hopefully. Waffle crap for a bit. <laughs> That's right. what we like. That's it. Right. No tea today, just gin. <laughs> Neat gin. Water, mate, gotta get ready for the weekend. Keep hydrated. Yep, racing bro. So, 5.2, Gen 2 head. Um, so this is different from a Gen 1. Uh, there is one major difference that I'm not gonna give away, but it's pretty significant from Gen 1 to Gen 2 heads. Uh, so, Gen 1 R8 V10 and Gallardo to Gen 2 R V10 and a Hurricane. One big difference. Um, the smart people watching who've had these apart will know what it is. Uh, the other differences are the intake ports look completely different. They Before they were natural cast and now they're not, so they, they're they CNC'd. Um, it's not the best, uh, but for this job uh, it's good. The flow numbers are pretty good, so um, we've got friends with a flow bench who let us use it. They do some product for us. Uh, so the, all the Gen 1 heads are natural casting, so they look like this, rougher actually, quite a bit rougher. Um, whereas the Gen 2s are significantly different. The inlet port profile is different. Uh, where the manifold meets, because the secondary injector basically sits. Uh, get a pointer, use that secondary injector sits sat like that so whereas on the um, on the gen 1 this came across flatter at the top you didn't have this scallop at the top the gen 2s and the hurricanes where they've got port injection as well uh, they, they make that difference um, in the port the cam frame ladders are different. So before you could put the engine into top dead center on one, you could lock the cams and you could get to all the um, uh, the head bolts and they haven't done that anymore. So the cams, completely different now. They don't have the cutouts between the journals to allow you to do that. So you've got to take the entire cam bridge off, you've got to take the cam out um, to get the heads off, which is a bit of a ball ache if you're doing repairs, engine build sort of thing, it doesn't make much difference, they're coming out anyway, but say for instance you were just doing a head gasket, before you could drop cam barriers off, drop a timing chain out, lift the whole head off as one, lift it all back on, you can't do that anymore. Um, so is what it is. Um, uh, Pump load is different for the DI. Um, other than that, they look pretty close to the Gen 1 heads. Valve train, again, apart from one or two major differences, springs, retainers, that sort of thing is identical. So that's a stock inlet valve, that's a stock exhaust valve, that's a pair of springs. Springs are identical front to back. So the only thing that changes the spring pressure is the installed height. Um, that's retainer. So 
we've seen quite a few of these break, snap, um, when a valve control, when you get a valve control out of sync or you, you go over your valve control. Uh, we do a couple of like uh, LMS GT3 engines for people that are race engines and when they buzz them, when they overspeed the engine, we see these break. Uh, they're five litres or used to do it more, um, but you still get it with your valve controller, just go crazy and you break a spring. Uh, they are three groove valves, so your collets are three groove and the end of the valve is a three groove, so where they fit on. This is, this is mainly, you only ever see this in OEM, and the reason you see it is one, because they run a different angle um, on the valve, but it allows the valve to turn. So when it's getting pushed open and then turning and spring pressure, the, the free groove allows it to turn. And as an OEM, that helps keep carbon buildup off the seat. Um, when you start going into performance stuff, they move from a free groove to a two, to a single, and it's radius. Um, so whereas you might see some are square edged, um, square edge grooves, the performance stuff now is, is mainly radius groove, and that allows the pressure of the valve action to be absorbed nicer into the valve. Um, or from the spring to the valve, that interaction, it's just through a radius, it's a lot nicer. And you see it on cam and crank webbing. You never see square edges, because square edges is a stress point. You always see a nice radius edge. So we go from a free groove valve to a single. Um, and that's normally a performance enhancer. That's, that's, a, that's a pro. Uh, valve stem, oil seal. So you get two different types uh, on the new Golf GTIs, uh, the new 2.9 uh, RS5 and RS4 engines. It's actually the spring seat and the valve stem seal are one. Here's one I made earlier. Look like that. We run separate. So we run separate ones. Um, so it would sit like that. Now the reason you use a spring seat is you have a steel spring in an aluminium head. And believe it or not, the spring turns, the whole valve assembly will normally rotate, but the spring turns. There's a couple of really cool slow motion videos on uh, YouTube of an engine being pushed and the springs rotating. So what happens is the spring will gall on the head and it will basically, it will dig itself a groove. And like you drive down roads and you've seen lorries driving down the same road over and over and you can see where the tire tracks have gone. You'll get that in the head. You get spring groove in the head. So we use spring retainers, sorry, spring seats. Um, we can also play with these. So we have different thickness spring seats. So they're stock um, and we make our own, we shim them. Um, if we can't get the valve control we want, uh, or the valve specs we want with the springs, so spring pressures, we can shim the spring. The offset with that is you spring it, you shim it too hard uh, and you reach coil bind quicker. So you're basically preloading a spring. So like a motorbike or a car where you, you make the spring do more work at rest um, to move the spring rate line up. Um, you, uh, you just move your spring close to coil, coil bind. So you have to be careful with that. Um, so that, is stock valve train assembly that is it that's how it would look so we get rid of them we get rid of them those those we keep that and we replace those so this is now it this is a super tech kit it has in canal exhaust and it has nitroided stainless inlets. Now the stock has it as well. So this is something that's really cool. This is called an undercut valve. So a six mil stem. So that's the stem that runs in the guide. Um, the guide not only keeps your valve 
uh, running true to your seat, but it's also uh, an area where heat gets back into the head. The biggest heat transfer point is your seat, but also through the stem. So we want a nice stem to give us strength, but not so thin that the, the valve can wander. So you, you're balancing how much heat you can transfer, how much stability you've got in a valve, but ultimately with weight. Uh, so you're balancing that. But they're called undercuts. So and the reason they're called undercuts is as it transitions out the bottom of the guide, it actually goes thinner. Both of them have got the same. I don't know if you can see it properly. So this section is in the airflow. If you can imagine, that's the guide. That's the section in the airflow in the port. So it's trying to obstruct as little air as possible. So we use undercuts. Um, we use pretty big valve seats. And what I mean by that is uh, the seat area. So on a race engine, you can run them right down because your service life comes up. Um, so if you can see, if I put a, put a pen marker on it, you can see. So we get new valves. If you can imagine, that's the seat, the valve, and the same on the valve seat and head. On a race engine, something that's got short service life, you can run them really small. You can even run them like on uh, to like a radius, so rather than a free stage, a free step head or free stage seat uh, with three different angles, you can run them as a radius, so a constant radius, but service life just falls through the floor. But if you're looking for power, then that, that gets you what you want. Uh, on what we're doing, we, we normally build fast road engines or this, this incarnation is our fast road engine that is twin turbo. So we've got a lot of heat. We've got to get out of the valve uh, into the head. We've got to transfer that heat out. So we use a big seat to help get the heat out of the valve head into the valve seat, into the head, and then away into the cooling jackets. We've got to get that exhaust energy out. The inlet valve, yeah, we run a big seat, but you've always got that cool air coming in to help cool the inlet valve, which is why you'll always get the, the worry with the valve temperature is always on the exhaust. So that's what we do. Um, and also, you know, you want to do 20, 30, 30 40,000 miles of these engines. So if I go to like a 0 0.3, 0 0.4 mil thick seat, a seat in face, it won't be long. And we'll have, um, we'll have ceiling issues because they just, they just can't take it. They'll burn up. Um, that is titanium retainer. So this is all super stack super tech stuff and then a spring in the next video we'll go through the difference between those and those so i've got the spring tester out i've done the math already and, and i'll show you how we test the springs um and that is it from a parts point of view we've got a fit in head already so we've got a inlet and exhaust sat in and I've sat them in already because I wanted to work out what the install type was uh, on this head. So we've cut seats because we've cut the seats. Um, it's changed how deep the valve will sit in the head. So you can't just take one value and go, oh, all heads will be the same because you've taken material off uh, the valve seat, which allows the valve to then come into the guide more or less. So you have to work it out. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, flip it on his back. We're gonna pop. No guard, no seal, no nothing in. Um, so no spring seat. Sorry. Um, no seal in for the moment. I'm just gonna pop this together to show you. Uh, because we are on a bench, it is clean, but I don't want to damage the ceiling face. So I'll just take the take the ceiling face out. Use a bit of tissue. We basically pack the combustion chamber like a so and then we drop the head place the head on its face the reason i've done that is i'm now going to compress the springs uh, so i can drop the retainers in so put two springs in and they look like that Is it stuck in front of you? 
Oops. Yeah. Factory tool. So you bolt this plate to the top of the head. Put a, you'll see what this is for in a minute, but this is our clamp. So, and then this is the loader. So it just looks like a like the top of the valve. And what you do is you take your retain each retainer or each uh, collet. Sorry, pop it in the loader. And then this little tool will hold them apart. So if I pull if I pull the back, the two prongs disappear and then inside are two little springs so what we do is we line it up this is gonna mess up now you watch they're gone and they're sat in here so you get a little flat blade screwdriver to fit that one out of the way back a little bit. sit down the guide like so Anybody is sat watching this now who has done it with the old school G clamps, providing this works properly, you drop it in like it is, you compress it down, and then you pull the pin out. And that drops the collet into the retainer. And then as you release it off, there's two little springs in the bottom. As you release it off, the, re the collets drop into the valve. So that is it, done. It honestly it looked like a ball ache, but it is easier. So if I now strip that out, Davey can have a look in. It is good. If you've ever had to do it the old school way, here we go. Where's me? So. The old school way was this. So you would have it up like that. Then with your G clamp. And you would essentially hold back a valve and then hold. Retainer to compress it. Yeah, easy peasy. Job done. Compressor spring. Now try getting them in. And that is the worst bit. You've either got a screwdriver with a bit of grease on the back, and you dab it on and try to get it in and get it sat and juggle them both and hold them and then wind it off, or you'd use a pair of tweezers. Either way, for considering this for like the 21st century it's shit so however infuriating that tool can be it is the better way and it also means as well you don't scratch the back of your valve you haven't got to hold the back of the valve head with that it's the same with that one so they do a job um but that's bad so and that is it we end up with a fully loaded head with everything in so that's how it would normally no look what we obviously haven't done, oh, I dropped it. On these two that we've put in, just because we were getting measurements, to show you how we put the valve guide in. Uh, sorry, the stem seal in. So we have got a little tool to do it. That's a, that's the removal tool. Uh, and this is a fitting tool. This is good for the joined, the seat, spring seat and seal combined ones. But for this, if I try and push it in the loader look, you see it like sort of pinches the spring out a little bit. So I don't really like it. 
So for these ones, it is a 10 mil snap-on double hex. And all you're trying to do is, you're trying to put the pressure on the metal on the, on the frame, and it literally just drops straight in. So we do that. You haven't got to put a lot of force through it. We don't turn that in. There it goes. A little bit of assembly grease. Line it up on a guide. Sit it there. And then just push it on. And you just push it. That's all you've got to do. And that is it. Sits in there lovely. You feel it seep home. Um, and that's all good. And cool. that is how you build a head. Pretty, I suppose it's pretty basic. Um, but even down to saying about seats, spring seats, if you look inside the head, you can even see where there's metal inserts for the head bolts. Um, and the reason I haven't pushed the seal on is because I want to put the head back through the tank before we build it finally. Um, so the steel washers inserted in the head for the head bolts to sit on for when you torque it up so you don't you're not putting the pressure on the aluminium, same as when, why we use valve spring seats. So that is it. Once you are done, you end up with something that looks like this. Completely finished. Here's one we prepared earlier. Si senor. Then your valve control is done by a tappet, which is fed oil pressure. So, so it's basically, it, it's a, an, a, an adjustable tappet. It's got a one-way valve in it. So oil pressure will expand it. And then because it's a one-way valve, it can't decompress. It's got a roller on the top, bearing roller on the top that drives on the cam. And then it's got the foot to sit on the valve. So that will drop, we do it that one. That will sit in the tappet groove. We'd fill the tappet grooves with uh, assembly uh, assembly lube anyway. Uh, so it would sit like that. And then if you can imagine, it's not the right cam. But your cam then sits in and then runs on that roller rocker. And then obviously as your cam rotates, it'll get to a certain point. And you can see there, look, it's trying to jack the cam out because there's nothing holding it down but it will, the roller rocker will then push against the tappet, which doesn't move, but it, that keeps your valve lash adjusted and then it will just roll it down on the, on the valve. So that is the valve train. A pair of, I have got them on the end. A pair of variators. So cam chain runs on the sprocket the center drives the cam and the sprocket is joined to the outside and on the inside then are two oil galleries one for advanced one for retard and the solenoid will just supply oil to either advance or retard to move the center camshaft different or relative to the sprocket and that's how it changes timing and that literally just pops on the end like so and then it's the oil's passed through these two galleries. So it's passed into one, pushed into the variator on one side to advance the cam, pushed in the variator the other side to retard the cam. And they have a set point as well. So if the variators lose say electronic control, the cam timing sits at a static point, which is where they are at rest. Um, that's it. That is cylinder head cool so um next next video what are we going to look at so next video is uh spring pressures um so we're going to talk about i've done some math on the board and we'll do spring pressures and i'll show you the difference between uh the uprated springs and the stock springs um and then the main reason is why why we change them
Good stuff. Cool. Cheers, buddy. See you in a bit.